Hello everyone, um, I'm Claire Money. Uh, it's great to be at Write the Docs Australia 2022. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, my talk is about content chaos, which I'm sure we are all familiar with. Um, and my story that I'll be presenting is about um, one way that you can uh, run a content project in order to um, contain some of that content and, and get, get a business on the path to to better content normal. Um, so I, I guess in other words, it's kind of like one way to deal with a big awful content mess. Uh, so a bit about me, uh, I've worked as a tech writer most of my career, um, but you know, of course we all know that's a big umbrella and I've done other things, uh, UX writing, content strategy, um, event writing, brand writing, technical content marketing, web writing, business writing, blah, blah, blah. As a freelancer in my own business, which I have been for the last few years, that's Lacuna Information Design. Um, I was, um, I did all kinds of writing, any kind of writing really. Uh, but one of the contracts that I did is what this, this story is about. Uh, I couldn't start without introducing my greyhound Nessie. This is her, um, she's a greyhound. She is eating ice cream in that picture and she's my office mate and, um, you know, person that I work with. So she had to come into it as well. Uh, I currently work for a company called Kind. Uh, I'm their senior UX writer. I do the docs as well. Um, so I look forward to having more presentations based on what it's like doing that in a startup world. Um, so tune in next time. But today's story is about, like I said, a, con a contract that I did not that long ago. Uh, lots of chaos in the project. Uh, lots of um, lots of opportunity for the business, and I was the first tech writer on the ground. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how that how things finished up and where where I left them. So I am going to de-identify the company I talk about. So I just sort of wanted to give a profile of the company instead. Um, they're an e-commerce company. They're kind of eight years old, six, eight years old, 150-ish employees and, and growing. Um, they were getting some big global customers in and starting to really scale rapidly. And they were outgrowing the sort of current, current ways of operating. Uh, so there's about 350, 400-ish articles in the, in the knowledge base when I arrived. Um, and which I think is like pretty okay for you know most uh, you know te tech writer to approach um, single tech writer to, to, to manage but um, not with um, the shape that it was in let's say so a little bit about how I discovered the chaos. You know, things start out as they usually do in a job. You're, you know, you bring all your energy and enthusiasm and your experience. Um, I talked to lots of people and got a sense of things. I poked around in files and of course the knowledge base. Um, and I got a sense of the kind of culture of the place, why the docs had been neglected, why, why, um, they needed me. Um, you know, they hired me on the basis of, can you help us improve the docs? And of course, um, tell me more about the docs. Okay. They are over there <laughs> was the kind of extent of things. Um, and if I was to gauge the content maturity of the business, which I often kind of do, it's a, it's a way of finding out how I should work. Um, I would say they were kind of barely stepping out of that primordial ooze of, of, you know, um, of things. They had a good tool. They were using Zendesk as their doc management, you know, sort of, um, knowledge management system. At least it was purpose, purpose built, even if it's out of the box. Um, but they didn't really have the know how to operate it well or organize it well or those kinds of things. So that kind of brings me to, um, the content that was discovered. And I think none of the things on this list are going to be a surprise, but all of them at once were quite overwhelming. So just a few little issues, you know. Um, so they had no ownership of the docs. So the first thing I noticed was, you know, the support team were kind of like, oh, we try and keep them up to date and people put in requests for new articles, but it's a bit hard. You know, there's a lot of work to do. Plus they're dealing with support things. Um, there's no strategy for them. So, that, so, so of course, when there's no ownership, there's no one really thinking about how they should, how they should grow or, or how they should be developed. Um, and because of the way they had been added to, you know, over time as needed, as the product grew, uh, there was no real structure had to how they were put together either. So no one taking care of that and curating that. 
Um, and of course, uh, without ownership, there's no processes. There's really no, no way of, um, ensuring documents are updated, um, or, um, you know, how they got updated and, you know, if any feature got added to the product, what was the process? Um, and there was also no coverage. Um, or poor coverage rather. So the product hadn't been fully described uh, in the documentation. And of course, when users come to use things, they will find the very thing that you haven't documented and try and find that. Um, and of course, it's unscalable at this, you know, with those kinds of problems, it's completely unscalable to try and, to try and, um, to do much as well. So this is a bit of a, not a shock, but certainly a, a big, a big deal. And just a few more things on top of that. When I zoomed into the documentation and had a look as well, there's sort of mixed quality, you know, of course, contrib contrib contributions from all over the business meant, um, you know, there was a bit of developer speak, a bit of business speak and, and, and a mixed quality of um, documentation, different styles, kind of inconsistent terms, not very searchable because of that, very product focused. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about that later, how the documentation was kind of shipped as, uh, as features in the product and not as, not as kind of, um, you know, ways that, you know, task-based uh, thinking as well. Uh, so they got out of date quickly as well. So, a, you know, a document would be written like, oh, we've just added this feature that does this. And, you know, six months later, it still had that kind of intro in it. Um, and, of course, when you don't have the right terms, when you don't, when you aren't, you know, taking care with headings and other things and organising things well is poor navigation. People can't kind of find what they need and get around very well. So these are some big problems. And the second column sort of, a result of the first column um, as well. So there is a relationship between the big issues uh, and the smaller issues as well. But something I do want to acknowledge alongside having these big and small problems is that there was really great support for this project in the business. There was there was there was a lot of people saying, "Thank God you're here. We really need this." Um, the, I, have, I was assigned a really amazing business SME who had been in the business a long time, so knew the product really well, but also knew everybody in the business really well. So, you know, when I said, oh, I need to talk to one about this, they would know who what, who to who to go to and all of that kind of stuff. And um, you can't undervalue that in a project. And that's a really important reason why this project succeeded. And um, I'll call this person Scott um, for want of a better name. Um um, there was also a good appetite for change in the business. So this is really another critical thing, like f proper support from the business means that you're not kind of struggling to get change to happen. You're not struggling to get people to pay attention to it. So, um, but of course there was no going forward without telling the business the truth about what was going on. So this is the plain truth that I kind of revealed to them and it's, um, you'll notice I've just done a few lists. I promise that you'll go, I, I promise there's not all lists in this presentation. Um, but this is what I wanted to communicate to the business in the simplest way possible. Without these things in the first com column, you have the things in the second column, you know, without structure, you have poor quality and, and, and things are neglected. Uh, without good coverage, it's unsearchable and not integrated properly, et cetera. So you've got this kind of cause and effect thing, but the thing that I really wanted to communicate to them was that there was this place that you could get to, this this you'll never get to the place you want to go, which is to be a trusted, reliable source of information, to have good coverage of um, you know, all of your of all of your whole product. Um, and for people to feel like things were owned and cared for, you know, um, you can tell when um documentation's well, well curated. Um, there were also no quality processes, so I definitely wanted to leave them with some processes and options for going forward. And and people want to know what to do when there's a gap. What do I do? Um, and also uh, back to the coverage is is kind of keeping pace with th the way things are getting developed. So you know this is the way we work with product teams. We we um we try and stay in lockstep with them so that we know what's coming and we can document it and we can talk to them about it because we know that as soon as it's off their plate and it's developed and done, they're not as interested in it again talking to us about it again. So that stuff's really important and that's what makes things scalable as well as we know. Um, you can't scale documentation when you've got a really poor starting point. You can scale documentation when you've got some really good things in place. So that's where I really wanted to get the business to. 
that's why I, the next part I talked to them about and the way I communicated things was we can fix some of this big stuff, but we have to turn it into a project. We have to consider this kind of emergency, um, not emergency maybe, but um, definitely uh, projects have urgency and they have backing and they have a temporariness to them that uh, is more appealing to a business when you call things a project. Um, to uh, change is a project in a way um, because the thing, like I said, I wanted to emphasise was getting to this BAU, getting to this um, place um, where things are normal and reliable and all of the positive things but without we have to solve the problems that are causing, that are blocking us from even getting there um, and there's sort of no way around <laughs> doing that. Um, another thing I talked to the business about, and these are just two of the numbers, but there was quite a lot of um, data, is 4366. This is an enormous number, enormous number of support requests that they the support team processed in a year. Um, there was like a team of five people that were handling things a lot. And we all know, everybody here knows that, you know, documenta good documentation could probably have solved a third to half of these tickets, if not more, um, because people like to look after themselves if they can, but only if they can get information quickly and accessibly and, um, you know, when they need it at the time they need it. So um, there was, there's no getting this number down without doing some of the things on the, on the, big, the big issues list. The other number was that most searches failed. So this is where things get right into the, the, the nitty gritty of, of poor content and why poor content fails. Um, 30%, 38% failure rate is enormous for, um, you know, uh, for utter search failure. So this wasn't even hitting the page and then moving on to somewhere else. This was complete bounce and abandonment of the documentation. Um, this is a really high number as well and, um, uh, and you know, is not fixable without decent content. Um, um, it's not the tool itself. The search works fine provided you have the right content in there and, um, you know, I had to talk the business through this at the time. The tool is not going to fix the content problem. Um, that's, that's definitely something I, I emphasise. So as we move into talking about the fix, the f well, how do we fix things? So, and the approach I wanted to take, and I was on a six-month contract initially, I knew that could extend, but, uh, you know, it's not infinite, um, all of that. So how do I do the maximum amount of work in the minimum amount of time? How do I kind of maximise my effectiveness um, from what I already have um, and, and, and offer a solution to the business that can get them to this BAU um, in a short period or as short a period as we really can anyway? So... That's like firing an arrow through multiple targets, you know. Um, how do I, how do I kind of choose activities that are going to get the most, um, um, hit the most, um, solve the most problems essentially. So these are the three things that I pitched, the three targets that I really wanted, th thought the business wanted to hit. And if we hit these, we were going to be in a much better place to get to this content normal that I kept pitching. So. The first pillar being restructure. So we had to restructure the knowledge base. It was a complete mess and, and not just in itself badly structured, but um, things were unfindable, things weren't grouped well, things weren't labelled well, things were, um, you know, aligned to the org chart, um, you know, the old shipping the org chart thing, which is never a good thing. Um, there's also the part where no, but the ownership problem was a really big one to solve because without ownership there's no kind of maintenance, there's no... There's fixing it and then there's abandonment again of, um, you know, letting it go to seed or something. So the ownership piece was extremely important. So that had to be tackled. And then I just, I've called this reform just because I needed a single word to do it, but the content itself needed reforming and the business needed reforming in how they thought about content. And that was, and that this is where I think it's critical to understand that, that, you know, that product led documentation, like this feature does this, this feature does this instead of user led documentation which is more like if you want to do this, this is how you go about it. If you want to achieve this task, this is how you go about it because we actually know here 
that users are trying to do a thing. Users aren't trying to use our software to have a good software experience. Users have a business to run. They have things to do. They use our documentation just to get those things done. So, um, and the only way to kind of make documentation more effective and searchable is to think like a user, is to have that empathy. And this is a really big message that I wanted to talk to the business about. And I'll talk a little bit more about how I broach that and, and when we broach that as well. What did I, what was the first, what was the main activity that I thought would get us to all of these things? What's the arrow that I chose to shoot through all of these targets? Workshops. Maybe some of you are sighing or thinking this is not a great idea. Um, workshops I know are fraught. There are complications with workshops. Um, you know, they are, um, they can be labor intensive. Um, they can, you know, uh, yield too much output that you can't even do anything productive with. They're not great for big groups and things like that. So, you know, love them or hate them. Workshops have a purpose though. And, um, I really went and wanted to push the workshop approach, particularly, particularly because we needed the buy-in was necessary. The ownership part was a big piece. So um, um, having that and having um, bringing people together to talk about and own and understand things was really important. So these are the sort of three reasons I, I chose workshops. And, and one is, first of all, is that um, people get to voice frustrations. Like workshops are a great place to kind of just cathart, you know, yeah. Um, all those pent up documentation complaints, but also, um, and, um, and so I, and it would give me an opportunity to also uncover what the real need was behind that. So where the documentation is failing, um, where the frustrations lie, there are all the opportunities for improvement, right? <clears throat> the other part is that, um, teams having input and becoming part of the solution mean that they, um, and they can see and when they're when they're part of the change process, really buy into um, the benefits that they're going to get. So, you know, um, I could in a workshop talk about, well, what could it look like if that happened? What could it look like if it happened? And bring people on that real um, um, tell me about how you want it to be, that kind of that kind of idea as well. Um, and they contribute to the solution. That input's really critical. And of course, the third piece being ownership. Ownership being like, I can't labor on this enough, but someone owning and being in the business who, who permanent, uh, um, people taking responsibility for the content and ensuring it's updated was just like, there was just, this was going to all going to be for waste without, without that piece. So that's really important as well. Um, the only way to run a really good workshop though is to prepare really well for them. So the plan was, and I worked with Scott on this, my SME sidekick, to really come up with the best possible way that we could do this, the best format we could do this in. And so we made lots of assumptions. We'd collected data already. We had the data of the business. We knew what the problems were. I'd done my assessment and we brought all this to the table and we kind of put some assumptions together like, um, people are needing more of this, more onboarding experience, more, more, more of this type of structure. People, people mostly search, um, our, um, you know, another big stat in the business, which I wasn't on that slide was that, um, half of the users of the content were internal people, like the internal people in the business were using this knowledge base a lot and it was failing them. So, um, adding some of thinking about what they needed as well as users. Um, you know, they're an extension of our users as well. Um, cause they were putting together information for, for them too. The next part was scripting. So we really were careful about how we scripted the workshops. We wanted to run similar workshops for most groups, um, because we wanted to be able to kind of replicate, um, the process and to make sure everyone felt equal in the process as well, equal opportunity through the workshop process. That was important too. I didn't want to kind of selectively ask group, this group, this and that group, that, um, everyone kind of, I wanted to, to have that broad view. And the reason for that was, um, you know, so I could change multiple things at once. This wasn't just one conversation about changing one thing. This wasn't just a restructure conversation. This was about ownership. This was about the content and the, that reform as well. 
So, of course, we had to come up with the pitch as well. And that was my role a fair bit, um, talking about, um, you know, the pitch of where we are and where we need to be. So we had a really great simplistic, sim- sim- simplistic, <laughs> simple, um, clear, you know, um, goal of where we wanted to get to. And people were like, yes, yes, that's, that's yes, things rung true to them. So that pitch was really important as well for getting that buy-in. Um, the other thing we carefully did was invite people in a certain order. So usually you might invite the top people to come in and give their opinion because they we think their opinion is the most important and then kind of work down from there. But actually I flipped that on its head. Um, it was way more valuable to have the kind of frontline teams come in first. So they were the support team. Uh, sales and onboarding teams, people who really worked with customers all the time and knew what customers were missing, were demanding, were needing. Uh, the next teams were the beneficiary teams, and I, I touched on them a little bit before, which is they're the internal teams who, you know, use the knowledge base to um, to advance a sales conversation, to um, help um, out with support, to, to do all kinds of things, um, to pr- put together presentations within the businesses and other things as well, and to, you know, marketing used it for describing features and, and other things and updating websites. So they're the be- beneficiary teams. Then I got to the level of SMEs, and look, they were the heavyweights they brought the knowledge of how things should be and how things worked and what the tasks really were for business for the for the users rather um and so they are they are a huge like at the bulk I, I would say of the of the um workshops as well and as we did workshops we identified owners and so owners came in last because by the time the owners came in I'd already given them ownership um but I'd already confirmed with multiple people that they were the right owners too and um, so there was some side activities that were going on as part uh, uh, with these workshops, which I'll touch on a little bit as well, but uh, there was a big ownership piece there too. Um, so the owners needed to agree that these were their areas um, and um, there's a certain kind of way that we did that. So what does a workshop kind of look like? Miro. Miro was our friend during the workshops. We basically instantly projected up our Miro kind of screen and we'd set up multiple kind of areas in Miro where um, this first one on the left is like, was like a, um, a, you know, um, what do you call it? Like a scrape of the search um, um, that yielded all the search terms that people have been looking for and they were categorized and and, and, um, grouped and things like that. That work got done before I arrived. But it was proof that, it was proof of search failing, was proof that there was a mismatch between what people were searching and what they were finding in the documentation. So this was a real, um, a point to, to make sure people understood the kind of real basicness of the problem as well. Uh, then I talked through, we talked through the process for the workshops. Um, Scott gave a bit of a history of the issues and everything. And again, like I said, we, we sort of gave our pitch and we, we, we talked through, um, where we could get to. Uh, and this one on the right is a bit of a process map about, you know, this is how things should work. This is, this is what this, this is what things work when they're working really well. There's process. People know what they're doing. Different people are involved. Responsibility for content is shared. Um, and, it, and it kind of works well and it's controlled sort of um, by one person. But the deep, um, the big kind of main crux of the workshop was building this uh, knowledge-based structure. So while we were talking about those peripheral things um, here, we were working in this big sort of board here. Now, you can't kind of see any details here, but I can, you can probably see the colours. Um, the green is like top level um, category of information. There's yellow cards that were sort of subcategories and the orange cards are all the sort of the main topics. Um, there, this board kind of got bigger and evolved and uh, things got moved around a lot. Um, there's also little black tiles there and that's who the owners were. So we identified those people as we went. In some cases there were multiple owners, not ideal, but in some cases there was. And we shuffled, we reshuffled, we did um, exercises like um, what things, what should things be called. Um, whenever anyone added an orange card, I would make sure they added it as a task, so as a verb-led kind of um, thing. So if someone was, say, adding, oh, they do, we do, um, you know, like special shipping or something like that, I'd say, well, what's special shipping used for? Um, what, you know, how does a user think about special shipping? And they and they kind of gave a use case for it. And I would say, well, let's, let's talk about it as a task and, and add it to the board that way. So in that way, I could start to have conversations with the business too about them changing their thinking, you know, around 
um, what documentation does and who it's really for and who it targets and, and how it achieves sort of good searchability um, and all of that kind of thing. Next, we next. Um, so when the workshop, the workshops came to a bit of a natural close. So after we'd shuffled things around a lot, um, we, they kind of came to a natural conclusion. We had owners, we had that kind of thing. The next step was to get approval for this structure from top down. Now, I know we said we sort of flipped it around and we gave ownership to, to um, um, you know, the frontline people, but at the same time, the owners of the, the people, senior people in the business had to endorse this. And they had to endorse it so that we could tell people that they'd endorsed it. So there was no pushback from anyone about what the structure is. You want to talk about the structure? Go to the people who, who approved it. So this is the fuzzed out kind of like thing. This was, but this was a proposal for the new kind of structure for the knowledge base. And that was well received. Um, and we talked through, talked, they also went through a workshop and, and I kind of, um, you know, pitched, all of the same things that, that the workshops had been all about so that they understood what the process had been, so that they understood that who, you know, who the contributors in the business were, which is, you know, quite a lot of people who was consulted and that kind of thing. That was all really critical. So approval being really important to the next part of the project. And I mentioned that we did some parallel activity here. So um, the kinds of things that we were doing, you know, at the same time were things like content auditing and like renaming things, getting a few quick wins in the, um, in the Zendesk, having a look at the templates and design. I was writing a style and writing guide. Um, there was, uh, I was also doing, um, I was also doing um, pre um, presentations for owners. So, you know, inducting the owners into what it meant to be an owner so that they had a good understanding of that. And that was really important parallel work as well um, so that that was well understood. So, um, yeah, important, important piece of the puzzles, all that. So we had everything we needed for the project. We had this new structure. We had owners that we'd identified and we had approval now. So these are the, you know, these are the kind of important things. So how do we actually make this operational now? We've collected all the things we need to. How do we make it operational? Well, of course, we used a giant Monday board. So another big friggin list. Um, sorry. Um, we um, magicked somehow. Someone helped me magic out of Miro into Monday, you know, by group by group. Uh, so all of the things that were reflected in Miro, um, the big mess that we ended up with ended up in kind of contained in these lists of, um, in, in, in Monday. Then we went back to the owners and got them to set priorities on the, on, on their groups. Uh, and then we prioritized the groups as well. So we started working through a list and I've started to say we because a new writer came on at this time. There was just, you know, the scope of work was enormous. Like looking at this backlog, another 400, you know, 400, um, documents some uh, we mapped the current documents to these to see you know which which what were what, what documents would we update and what was new uh that kind of thing so that we had did that kind of like uh matching process um and this was kind of grooming i guess this backlog so that was that was pretty huge but once that task was done all we had to do is start working through this list and you know um being able to see how long things were taking us um you know things of course are a bit slower than you think access to people you know did drop off a little bit um but at, at around this stage i could i worked on a uh, parts of it I, I left the other writer to it and i ended up leaving the business and that's when i joined um, the company i'm with so just wrapping up now the remaining targets were to finish the writing to do a bit more redesign work on the on the help system, but um, you know that had become a lower priority, and then to start optimizing things, so start getting those processes in place, getting the owners used to things, and start start really um, kind of oiling the machinery for getting getting into the BAU part of things. But I did leave with them with a lot of tools, so that was style and writing guides, and outlines for training, and process maps. Um, and a resource plan even for, um, cause you know, of course, nothing can be done without people to do it. So, um, that's, that's sort of how things ended up. Chaos contained. Um, thanks very much for listening. Um, hope you got something out of it. Look forward to your questions. Welcome everyone. This is the first time I've actually spoken live to you all. So thanks for coming along today for, uh, to write the docs, uh, day one. Uh, it's really awesome to see so many um, uh, new and returning faces here. 
Um, but um, we've got a job to do right now, and that is actually to take some um, some questions from Braden and uh, and Claire. So I've got some. Um, I think I've got a selection of questions. I'm going to just sort of throw to you both, and we'll just sort of see how the conversation evolves and go from there. I think. So um, I've got the first one's actually for you, um, Braden. Um, and it was one that that I was interested in. So, how often do you typically run your link checker to validate your links on on Dolby.io? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we kind of run it in two different ways. Uh, we run it uh, first when our tech writers are done actually like writing up all their documentation and are ready to send it live. We do a quick check then, just in case there are any links to parts of the website that haven't been made publicly accessible yet, or in case there's a mistake in how the URL was formatted. And then we run it uh, every week. So we update our documentation at a pretty solid weekly cadence. So about every week seems to be a nice balance for us. Okay, so you're pretty much pushing out the docs as soon as they're ready. You're not waiting for any sort of sort of big deployment push like a lot of like some companies do It's just get them out as soon as they're ready. For, for some of our bigger releases, we definitely um, take that approach of, of holding it back. Uh, but we have so many different releases with some of our smaller products and things like that, that it just makes sense. And we have people actively trying to use that stuff straight away. Uh, so it just makes sense for us to have it up. Um, and, and a good note as well, we run the link checker first thing Monday morning. Uh, and we do that because we do not want to run it Friday afternoon, which was our <laughs> other idea. Because just in case everything breaks ahead of the weekend, we want to make sure that we have plenty of lead up in the week to, to fix up everything. So that's an important one to note. Just to sort of slide it back into BAU or business as usual work and just get it done like as time permits throughout the week. It's a really good approach, actually. It doesn't feel like the crush at the end of the week. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's really good. Now, Cameron actually posed the question as well, and it was about the the comment you made about people arriving at your site via images, which was an interesting one. He was wondering um, if the users that arrive via the images actually go on to engaging with the content in the page or whether it's just more they they get the picture and they want to see that in context of the, the other stuff around it. I just wonder if you might be able to help us understand a bit more about that. Yeah, definitely. So this is uh, one we actually investigated pretty in depth just because it threw all of us off guard. Uh, I think it was something like 5% of our traffic to our site and our site gets a pretty large amount of traffic, um, but about 5% was coming from images. Which at first you're like, well, that's not too much. But of the 5% of traffic that would come through, about 20% would actually actively sign up for an account. So we can track that through our platform. We can see the session. And that 20% that would actively sign up for an account is about a 5 10% improvement on what you normally see of people entering the site through the traditional way. Our, our running theory for why that's the case and why that's significant is a pretty large part of our organization is, is research. And a lot of these researchers are at conferences giving talks, um, presenting diagrams, putting diagrams in papers and things like that. And then we recycle and use a lot of these diagrams, like how our uh, WebRTC um, infrastructure is organized and how that architecture looks is like a diagram that we have. And so they're using these a lot. And I think people search on Google, like example of good WebRTC infrastructure. And like a couple images come up, they see how complicated it is to build it themselves. <laughs> Click on the image, go to the site, and go, oh, well, somebody else builds it for us. So we might we might check that out. That's that's very interesting. And that's a pretty good conversion of of just images alone. That's yeah, that's very, very good. Very yeah, good indeed. Definitely. I I think it very much depends on what kind of industry you're in and what kind of product you're selling. Like a lot of what we do is, is live streaming. So it's a very visual product. Uh, we have integrations with game engines. So it's very, very visual. And so I think a lot of those people um, resonate when they see a, a visual representation of a live streaming app, for example. Right, right. 
Uh, Claire, I might actually throw over to you mm -hmm. for a moment there because um, Cameron also asked uh, this question as well of your presentation. And that was what the role was of the, uh, the role profile of the owner role in that one and what yeah. the, um, the, the whole ownership piece was um, for, for that uh, particular job description. Look, in hindsight, I kind of realised I probably should have elaborated on that a bit more since I laboured so much on talking about how important it was. The owners are the people who, um, like, own the change of the content, I suppose. So it's the product manager usually uh, who is aware of what's coming, new feature, what new features are coming, what, um, you know, what might be changing about something, navigation, other, other things that might be changing in the product. They are responsible for making sure the docs get updated and... and um, one of the points of communication to them was you're not responsible for doing the change necessarily, but you're responsible for making that change happen. So ownership is about um, not not necessarily the doing, but definitely being responsible for it happening. Um, how, however, that what you know in in whatever shape that takes, um, and that might that might be there's a tech writer on their team that might mean they assign that role to a developer or other person to 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 try and make that happen or. Um, you know, I was trying to get the business to hire more tech writers so that there were actually people to delegate the work to. Otherwise, who does it? Um, but, yeah, so uh, apologies for not making that super clear in the presentation, but an owner is, yeah, definitely the person responsible for making sure the docs get updated. So the person driving it, basically. Yeah. Sorry? The person who's just driving other people to get the work done. Yeah, but they also own the, the expertise of that area. So they own that part of the product that is, you know, about the function. So they understand it the best. Their developers work on it the most. The QAers, you know, understand things and, and that kind of thing as well. So it was it's about aligning the right expertise, I suppose, to the area of documentation as well so that a tech writer, whoever it might be, um, doing the documentation knows who to go to, knows who's driving it, knows who to ask questions of and that kind of thing too. Right. Actually, there's another question that's just popped in now, so I'm going to stay with you for a moment there, Claire. Um, you talked about the feeling that the the doc uh, that that the tool was a problem when it wasn't. Um, did you find though that the tool you were using did have limitation that made it a little bit harder? Um, I'm not sure if it's the bit where I said the tool can't solve the problem. Maybe um, that's it. Yeah. If if that was the comment, because I find I found a lot as a contractor going into the business, they were kind of like, "Oh, maybe we need a different tool to do this." And it's sort of like the tool kind of isn't the problem. You can pretty much make any tool do what you want it to. I mean, obviously, some are better than others. No, no arguments from me on that one. Yeah. But but if without the good content, without just the starting point of decent content, even like proper organization or any any of that, you you doesn't matter what tool you use, you're going to have a big hot mess. So um, if that's with the clarification that you that you're after, that's sort of what I meant, because I, I actually didn't find Zendesk a problem. It was fine. It's purpose built. It kind of the, the docs for Zendesk were pretty good. And, um, you know, it's not too hard to use. Uh, it's just that if you you know, if you, it's like any tool, if you're not, um, it's not, it's, it wasn't about giving people an experience of the help, you know, it's that, that leap you have to make, which is like, I'm not trying to get people to use the help and have a good experience. I'm trying to get people back to what they're supposed to be doing with the content in the help, you know. Um, solving their job to be done. Yeah, so. solving the job to be done, not trying to, yeah, so it doesn't, yeah, the doc experience is important, but the, Content experience is more important. Content is king after all. That's what we're here for. That's right. And queen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and queen, indeed. That's a good point. Um, uh, I think we've got um, uh, another one that's about Zendesk, which I'll, I'll just quickly ask because it probably will be a quick answer. What was the tool you used to get a list of all the Zendesk articles? Uh, the tool we use for what? Sorry. To to get a list of all of the Zendesk articles. Um, I'm not not exactly sure what was meant by that, but we just like there's a report in Zendesk that you oh. can kind of just list all the articles. So that's how we mapped the current articles to the new architecture that we came up with. But um, right. and apologies if that point wasn't clear, but the new structure was completely from the ground up built, not based on the previous. We just mapped the previous to the new to kind of get some reuse and get some update and maintain, you know, 
um, as much current documentation as possible, but we're just going to heavily update it because um, wholesale replacing it wasn't an option either because, you know, you lose, you, you do lose um, uh, things like we would lose links from, you know, current onboarding presentations to the docs and stuff like that. If we could, you know, as update the target doc, we were better off doing that than sort of starting again fully. So mm. I, I'm not sure if that answered the question or not. I'm just watching the comments to see if you if it did just uh, shout out there. Um, the Zendesk is just gives you a list. You can sort the list of all your documentation in in like the last updated or the oldest or you know. So it's got some reporting. Yeah, it's got reporting few, functionality. I don't there. know if it's an add-on though. So I wasn't okay. really. I'm, I'm not really aware of whether that was, was like uh, you paid more for that bit or something. Mm. So, um, apologies if that's that's going to cost no, you. That's more. good. That's good. I think we I definitely covered it there. So thanks for the clarification there, Claire. Um, the uh, the last question I might throw back over to you, Braden, and also Claire. Feel free to to comment on this as well because I think your experience will probably say you might have some opinions about this too. How effective have you found sitemaps as a SEO tool, um, Braden? Uh, you know, at, well as a part of the SEO strategy, perhaps. It's a, another good question. Um, I think it's. When we made these changes and we decided that we were going to overhaul our documentation and improve it, we did a lot of these changes like in conjunction with each other. So I couldn't off the top of my head point out like an exact percentage of like a group traffic by this much. But I think all the good sites do it is probably the best way I can explain it. Like it, it's less about something that would necessarily improve your SEO as much as it's something that is just required to begin with, like mm. to have a good site. And so by not including it, you're actively uh, damaging your own com your own website's searchability. Uh, so mm. I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty useful and it's a really like low effort thing comparatively to actually do. Um, and so even if it is just a 1% increase, you know, it's still 1%. It's still an increase, that's right. Mm. What do you think about that, Claire? Yeah, I don't know if I've thought about sitemaps in the way that you're talking about sitemaps, but I've thought about content models, you know, the way your content structured and hangs together and relates to each other and how you how things are grouped and related and like that family tree of documentation kind of thing. So I definitely think of things that way. And for me, that's definitely about understanding not just not just provide um providing good organization or good spread or good that kind of thing, but um, really makes you think hard about um, the information itself and how it relates to each, you know, it, it, how content relates to each other and how you can create pathways through the content for people to find what they need as well. So I think that's really important and probably that's part of the SEO, right? So that journey, following links through and, you know, all that related stuff really matters. Um, but it, to me, I care about the user. It matters for the user. You know, I, I, can, I know I should care more about what Google thinks, but... <laughs> <laughs> I care about more what the user thinks first. <laughs> I think um, we're probably drawing towards the end of that Q&A session, which has is, is gone incredibly fast. It always does when we're actually talking about um, insights that people have got from um, your talk. So I just want to thank you both um, for, for taking the time out um, from your day to day to join us and, and answer those questions for, for everyone joining uh, the conference today. Um, before we go... Um, just wanted to give a shout out to Lynette Voller, um, who's been doing all of the amazing sketch notes um, for the, the conference. She's um, she. It was actually an Australian um, invention, not well, not so much invention, but for the conference, it was something that we pioneered here in Australia, and it's gone to the other conferences over overseas as well as something that's really valuable. So um, do check out the um, the links that are being shared on the Write the Docs Australia Twitter channel, which is Write the Docs AU, um, all one word. Um, and you can go and have a look at the uh, amazing ske the sketch notes that uh, Lynette's been doing up in there, along with all the other highlights that you would normally get from um, the uh, social media team managing uh, that account during the during the conference. but And one last thing as well, which is very important, is that we've got coming up the um, lightning talks as well. Now, um, 
Gaurav, I might actually just quickly run through them because we're a little bit short on time, uh, if you're all right with that. But um, we've got three people ready to step up and have a go. We've got Cameron Shorter uh, doing my open source docs uh, edition. And we've got Sean McGee Kinney doing red hot chili papers. <laughs> nice plain words. I do like a pun, as you probably realize by now. Um, print docs then and now. And then uh, Gaurav actually has got one of his own for unlock the hidden job market secrets to finding more writing opportunities. So that will be happening right after the break, which is happening right now. Um, so we're going to be coming back um, uh, at um, 2.45 uh, Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Um, for the lightning talks and um, Gaurav will be um, your host with the most for those running that session for you. So um, we will see you back here uh, at about um, 2.45. Cool. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.